and we are live. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We'll get started in just a second here. Hi everyone, uh, we're gonna get started here. Um, I want to welcome you to the March uh, Project of the Year Award presentation, our webinar today. Um, just to let you all know, we are recording this and the video will be posted on the Arizona State section website um, for your viewing later. Um, couple of announcements. Want to thank you to Y2K for hosting today's virtual event. Thank you. Um, couple of upcoming announcements. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, 
April 14th, we will be having another virtual lunch with the branch and that event will provide PDHs to the attendees. ASCE National is actually hosting a member um, referral program drive right now. Um, that's for the entire year. Each section, which is the state level, will compete based on the percentage of growth driven by the sections participating members. Um, prizes will be given out to the section and to the individuals. The top three sections can win a cash reward between $1,000 and $500 for the year, um, which will go back into programs um, we're putting on for you guys. Individuals can receive a $50 Amazon gift card for each newly joining professional member they refer. And the individual with the most successful referral rate will get up to a $500 Amazon gift card. Um, only thing you need to do, make sure you are in good standing and refer a member. So look at this um, link at the bottom right of your screen right now, and that's where you can go and get more information on that. Uh, for 2021, uh, make sure your company is represented at ASCE. You can be a, a sponsor for ASCE. Um, there's a lot of opportunities, so please contact any of the officers if you want to uh, get your logo represented. Um, there will be PDHs provided after today's luncheon. Um, give that a day or two, and we'll send those out to those in attendance. With that, I am going to turn it over to our vice president, Joe Dietrich, to talk on our awards. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we have three awards to give out today. The Government Civil Engineer of the Year, the Small Project of the Year, which is a project less than $10 million, and a large project of the year, which is a project greater than $10 million. So <clears throat> for the... Um, for all three of these awards, we asked our life members to be the judges. And you can see the list there of uh, the members who participated in this. And uh, Guy, Kent, Dennis, Don, Bob, James, Steve, and Don, we thank you very much for your participation. And we rely on them because of their great experience and their wisdom. And I'm sure they got the awards right. So with that, the first award of the year, first award goes to the uh, Civil Engineering of the Year Award. And you can see the list of criteria that the judges used to make their selection. And uh, <clears throat> this year we had two nominees. The first nominee was, uh, let me get my page here, John Farron Crosby. People may know him, he's the county engineer and Public Works Director for Apache County. And he submitted, um, an application was submitted for him. It was, uh, seemed to be complete and it was uh, very thorough. And he has certainly produced a uh, great record of public service as a civil engineer. But the judges, um, in a very close vote, decided to go with our winner, who was this year, Patty Kennedy. Many of you may know her. She's the Deputy Water Services Director, Wastewater Engineering for the City of Phoenix. And Patty <clears throat> had a uh, application submitted and her service to the City of Phoenix and to the civil engineering community and as a whole is outstanding. She's worked on many, many great projects and we are very, very pleased to present her this award for the Government Civil Engineer of the Year. I would hand this to her in person, but we are not in person, so that's not gonna happen. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, point out at the bottom of this award, you know, for significant contributions to public service engineering. And certainly I think Patty represents all of our civil engineers who work in public service, whether you work for a municipality or the government itself, or you work as a consultant who helps out the government. We, um, you know, we're all doing our best to contribute and make this a great society. And Patty, it certainly exemplifies everything that fits in that. So congratulations, Patty. So then uh, moving on 
to our project of the year award. The criteria is the same for the small project and for the large project. The only difference is money, and uh, which in this case was actually a huge sum of money difference, but that's okay. All projects are good, small or large. They all make a difference. And again, you can see the criteria that the judges use. And uh, for the small project of the year, unfortunately, or fortunately, depends on how you uh, take it, we, um, we only had one application. So they, they went away, in the, they, they ran away in the landslide. It was a great victory for them. Uh, I saw it coming. Uh, I missed my cue there. I should have said, it was no surprise to us. Sorry. That was what I wanted to say. We can move the slide ahead. There we go. This is the Small Project of the Year Award winner, SPA 1 Influence Structure Replacement and Improvements Project. The project team was GHD Inc. for Engineering, Felix Construction Company, the contractor, and the owner was the City of Surprise. Now you know why my surprise comment fit in there. So we are going to have a uh, presentation after we uh, make all the awards by the small project of the year and the large project of the year. So um, I'm sure you should want to stay around and uh, find out what these projects are all about. And again, congratulations to our small project of the year award winner. And for the large project of the year, we had two nominees. Um, and both these, I'm sure, are very, very well known to everyone in the community. If you're not aware of them, then I don't know where you live. Um, the first nominee was the uh, Loop 202 South Mountain Freeway. Um, an enormous project. And uh, it's just, I love riding on that road, just so everyone knows. It, I think it's a fantastic road. Our project team there, WSP USA, Floor Grant Ames Joint Venture, Aztec Engineering, Stanley Consultants, Maricopa Association of Governments, and the City of Phoenix. And of course, the owner was the Arizona Department of Transportation. And again, in a very close vote, uh, this project, as fantastic as it is, um, was not the winner. Our winner for this project was the Greenfield Water Reclamation Plant Phase Three Expansion Project. And our project team, Carollo Engineers, Brown and Caldwell, McCarthy Building Companies, and the owners were the city of Mesa, town of Gilbert, and town of Queen Creek. And again, this is a awesome project. I actually don't know that much about it, so I'm really looking forward to the presentation, learn much, much more about it. So again, congratulations to our large project of the year. And it was certainly uh, well-deserved and you certainly beat out another fantastic project. So that, that speaks volumes to what was done here. So with that, we can go into our first presentation, the small project of the year, I believe, right? Oh, we're gonna do a poll question. We're actually gonna do a poll question, um, but again, just huge congratulations to all of the award winners. Uh, we wish we could celebrate with you in person, but soon, hopefully. <laughs> um, in the meantime, uh, we're going to put on a poll question. Both of our project award winners are water projects. So a question we have for all of our membership, everybody online, um, what is your largest concern regarding water in Arizona right now? Um, if you can fill this out, um, we'll, we'll put up the results and see what everybody's kind of worried about. Um, is it resiliency, scarcity, quality, or everybody thinks everything's okay right now? <laughs> uh, I'll give you guys just a sec to look at that and hopefully click an answer. And then give a couple more seconds. All right, Maisha, would you post the results for that, please? So it looks like about 53% of you guys that answered say resiliency is probably your largest concern. 25% say scarcity, 22% say quality. And surprisingly enough in Arizona, everybody does not believe everything is okay. 
So that's thank a good you guys. Thing. <laughs> right? Exactly. I'm glad everybody has that engineering mind and worried about the future of what's coming on. Um, thank you for posting that. And with that, um, I will turn it back over to Joe to introduce our, our project teams um, presenting. We do have a Q&A function on, on the screen at the bottom of your screen. You can type in all of your questions. We will separate them out between small project and large project, and we'll make sure that they get answered for you. So you can use that. And with that, I will turn it back over to Joe. Okay, we're gonna uh, start with the small project team and uh, Frederick Kreck, Tack, excuse me, from GH&D is going to uh, introduce his team and tell us a lot about this project. So take it away, Frederick. Excellent, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen here and bring up the presentation. Can everyone see my screen or someone let me know? Yep, fine, That's good. Excellent. All right, well, first of all, I, I'd love to thank uh, both the ASC Life members uh, for participating in the awards and for the board for uh, hosting and providing opportunities um, to help get projects and clients recognized for their investments. Uh, definitely noted the you know difference in uh, dollar value between small and large projects. Joe, I appreciate what you said. Every project's important. And I, I think that's a mindset that as civil engineers, that's something we specifically take the time to look at for each project. So we're happy to share with you uh, today, uh, this project done for the City of Surprise. With me today is uh, Greg, who was the PM for the City of Surprise, myself, the PM uh, for the engineering, and then Dave Giannetto, who's a principal and was the PM for Felix Construction. Um, um, uh, first thing I'd like to do is turn it over to Greg to maybe share a little bit about uh, the purpose of the project and uh, any expectations. So, Greg. Okay, thanks, Frederick. Um, hi, I'd like to thank the ASCE today and uh, GHD and Felix for getting us the award. Uh, um, I was the uh, project manager of the site that you see there prior. Um, it was a brand new public works building, and we basically had to work around that junction structure that we had there in that picture. Could you go back to the other photo, Frederick? Sure. And you can see where the asphalt was replaced there and all. So we had to basically stay out of this section of the project. And then they handed me this junction structure literally after I finished the public works building to um, find out why the sluice gates weren't functioning. We, we, you know, we took a look inside from up above, about 30 feet up above or 28 feet. And we could see inside that there was a lot of corrosion. We just had the sluice gates repaired about three years ago, but they just oxidized out and just wouldn't function again. So it was, the job was given to me to get with, you know, to get the right engineering group and contractor on board to, to fix the, the issue. I brought GHD and Frederick in to do the initial evaluation and uh, what we needed to do as far as, um, you know, for repairs or what, what, what was our best course of action and how bad was the junction structure from not 28 feet above, but as you can see in one of his photos, they went right down in there and took a look. Um, he came back with three different or four different uh, options and uh, we chose one option. We then chose uh, Felix to come on board as a contractor. We all worked as a team to get it permitted and planned up and these guys, actually GHD and Felix, made it probably one of the easiest projects any PM could manage for sure. So after that, it was just, uh, you know, these guys knocked it out. No injuries. It was a safe, well-done project. We did some bypassing for a couple months. Uh, we, we are going back to do some other um, lining, I think, here in the next fiscal year. But... Uh, Everything just worked out really well as far as the owners were concerned. We couldn't have gotten a better job. And then we were even more happy when we heard we had won an award, but we didn't know we would win it so easily. So um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was a great job working with GHD and, and Felix. So, so uh, with that, I'll give it back to, to Frederick. Yeah, well, thanks for that, Greg. Um, 
So uh, just a little bit of insight on the project. Uh, this was to support the uh, City of Surprise Spa One Water Reclamation Facility. It's an 18 MGD facility. Um, it's the area on the image on the left um, in the red lines that serve the plant. And that plant is in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, basically in short, there's two ways to move uh, raw wastewater into the treatment plant. Uh, one on the west side, which is where this project is located and the other on the east. The important thing about this uh, connection and conveyance corridor is it conveys about two thirds of the wastewater from the service area. So it's a highly critical connection. There's no uh, you know, real redundancy to it. So uh, when Greg invited us in to take a look, uh, you know, we understood there was uh, basically some functionality loss of this structure. And um, uh, very wise of surprise, they wanted to take the time to actually uh, determine what is the root cause. And I think as we've, you know, all learned in engineering, the true cost, the largest cost of a project is that long-term operations and maintenance. So it'll far exceed the, you know, initial capital investment. And that's part of the ASC grand challenge is figuring out how to lower the overall cost of service um, to be able to sustain our infrastructure. So with that, we, we really took that approach in evaluating this project to figure out what was the root cause. And that's a little bit about what I want to share with you today. So, uh, you know, the first thing that was needed to, was to really get um, not just eyes on, but hands on and equipment on and technology on to really be able to quantify what this is. So in short, there's two wastewater collection lines that come together in this um, uh, concrete reinforced junction structure. And as you can see in the image on the top left, it's about 40 feet deep, about uh, 25 by 30 feet. And um, it has this wastewater flow coming into it from two different size pipes, um, um, uh, 36 and 48 inch, and they uh, commingle into a 54 inch pipe going out. Um, uh, first of all, getting in there to do the actual assessment, this was a live sewer assessment. Um, there was not the ease of ability to uh, isolate these flows. So we had to study the structure and the flow conditions, uh, both through modeling and observations to determine when the low flow was, uh, monitor air quality conditions to be able to get our inspectors in there. And of course, we ended up doing it in the middle of winter at three in the morning when it's as cold as it ever gets here in Arizona. Um, but what we determined is that the structure itself had lost um, the majority of its um, life cycle. The concrete was falling on the inside with deficiencies into and even past the first mat of rebar. Uh, the existing mechanical structures, as shown as the image in the middle, uh, were all carbon steel and, and completely corroded. So uh, the first thing we did was just delve into what was going on with the hydraulics. And in short, what is happening in this structure is the pipelines that feed it are designed to maintain a minimum self-scouring velocity. And that helps keep a lot of um, hazardous atmosphere hydrogen sulfide in solution. When you have a velocity change, two bad things happen. One, you drop out solids, which was occurring in this box. And then two, you are uh, opening up to more atmospheric exposure and more release of that H2S. So based on the uh, design and configuration of the structure was basically a hot box. There was no vent, no odor control. Uh, it was changing velocity, so it was dropping out solids, which also releases more hydrogen sulfide and causing more corrosion. So um, we were able to determine what were some of those root causes. Additionally, there was a CCTV camera work done of the pipelines that fed that structure from the right of way. We also determined that those were very heavily uh, both deposited and deteriorated and required some rehabilitation as well. Um, you know, other key things that we determined is uh, and evaluated was the need for odor control. Uh, could we just use odor control to be able to consume that H2S to, to minimize the um, uh, corrosion that would be occurring long term during that. Uh, overall, what we did was we developed a, a series of four different alternatives. And we didn't just look at the cost, we looked at uh, more important features that will speak to the long term costs like life cycle, operability, resiliency, and safety. Uh, in addition to the capital and O&M cost, and also looked at what type of schedule does it take, uh, take to deliver that, what level and duration of bypass is required, and really how does that impact the project. So of course, one of the options was just to rehabilitate it in place. That would require a full plant bypass, uh, going in there basically stripping down the concrete to sound substrate, rebuilding the interior, and, and putting all the mechanical components back. But that didn't really solve the velocity issues. 
Um, another option we looked at was to um, rebuild it. So completely tear it down and rebuild it new to restore a complete life cycle and potentially add odor control to it as well. And then we considered some other alternatives as far as um, replacing it with a different type of structure and different configuration. Uh, that has some pros and cons, um, but we knew we wanted to replace uh, more of the pipeline that was feeding it as those were corroded and the manholes as well. And the best way to solve the velocity challenge was actually configure this in a way that would maintain that velocity. Um, we had initially planned to do that with precast concrete um, manholes and structures. And that main junction st structure, rather than being a giant rectangle, would become about a, a 96 inch diameter wet well with a custom formed bench to keep the flow going the right direction and the right velocity. Um, we evaluated what that cost and timeline would be to implement, uh, also considering um, additional coatings would be required and whether odor control would be required. In short, what we came up with was using an alternative material, which uh, is a polymer-based precast manhole that uh, uses corrosion-resistant polymer. And what that does is it prevents the need to coat the uh, interior of the wet well as it's uh, resilient to that um, a corrosive atmosphere. So two things that did, it would help speed up the construction time, not having to wait to apply and test coatings. And three, the long-term operations and maintenance, it would alleviate the need for the operations team to go back in and evaluate and recoat possibly, uh, you know, uh, periodically throughout the life cycle. And with that, we were able to demonstrate there was a slightly higher cost in the uh, materials to do that, but overall it would provide a better long-term uh, operability, life cycle, and overall cost. So to talk a little bit about the construction of the project, I'll turn it over to David. Thanks, I get myself off mute. Uh, thanks, Fred. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, uh, Felix's uh, surprise location is immediately south of this facility, and uh, I happen to live about a mile and a half away, so I uh, I uh, was elected to be the project manager on this. Uh, whenever we do uh, bypass pumping projects of any size, you usually like to pick a guy that can take the phone call at two o'clock in the morning. So in this particular case, that worked out to be me. Um, <clears throat> uh, this illustration is some drone footage here on the left that shows uh, the excavation that was involved after the demolition of three of the structures. Uh, the time of day that we took this was towards the end of the day, as you can see by the shadows. So it's a little hard to get a feel for how big the excavation was, but uh, it was big. It, it may have been the, the biggest excavation I've ever been involved with um, in order to get down to the subgrade of the, of the structure and not have to do uh, shoring. We basically open cut uh, the entire thing. So it made a, you know, a, a tremendously big hole uh, but again, because we chose to open cut it for safety reasons, uh, you can see there in that photo that we had some temporary security fencing to make sure that we kept the site safe and separate from the city of Surprise because that facility did, uh, you know, maintain operation while we did it. And then that black line that you see there on the right that's running parallel with the pond is the two twin 18 inch uh, HDP and force mains that were running the bypass pumping operation for uh, I guess we were in bypass for about six weeks, maybe eight uh, at the end of the day. But as uh, Fred indicated, it's about two thirds of the overall flow for the entire city of Surprise was on bypass for this operation. Um, so uh, um, uh, big, uh, big, big excavation and um, probably one of the more intense bypass operations that I've ever been involved with, which made it a very interesting project. See the next slide, Fred? That one's mine. Yep, should be coming up now. Okay. Uh, another thing to point out is that we worked with GHD in the very beginning um, to uh, put in some flow monitoring devices, uh, 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 special instrumentation that would go down inside existing manholes because the city is surprised existing SCADA uh, data collection information was on their influent pump station. So they had a lot of data about how much uh, water was coming in, but couldn't necessarily get down to the granularity of how much was coming in from the West, much less how much was coming in from the Northwest and the Southwest. And of course that became very important in sizing 
uh, our bypass pumping system and either not making it too small and having issues of not being able to pick up in the event of a surge, but also equally important is not oversizing it where we would uh, cause an, too expensive an operation by getting too much pump out there. Uh, this photo here on the left gives you a little better indication of the depth of the hole. If you look there, you can see the little guy with the, with the yellow safety vest on. It'll give you an idea of just how, how big that hole is. And that particular photo is us flying in the first, peep, uh, first piece of 54 inch uh, SDR, um, uh, SDR 22, what did we put in here, Fred? I can't remember, but plastic uh, so. yeah. uh, for the very first piece that would connect to the existing system. And then over there to the right, uh, we see where we tied in uh, the northernmost uh, manhole that we replaced on the 36 inch line. So the pipe to the right there is the new uh, SDR pipe. And then to the left coming into the manhole was the existing uh, plastic uh, perforated or corrugated HDPE. Um, I was really excited on this project uh, to work with this new, these new polymer products. I've been hearing about them for years at various trade shows and, and uh, that we're in, all involved with in the water wastewater. And we've done some where it was new construction and there would be a polymer manhole as a part of the influence system, but never been a part of building ones that were as big as these, as Fred, in, as Fred indicated, uh, 96 inch on the main one and these other ones and doing all the, the stuff of making sure the inverts and stuff were right uh, because they are precast. So uh, that proved to be interesting and a uh, surprise and GHD were great to work with to get this all worked out. And uh, it really turned out to be a great product and we'll be there with presumably zero maintenance associated with any coding repairs uh, long after all of us are retired. So uh, really great project and we were, we were happy to be a part of it. Yeah, thank you, David. Just uh, a couple other things there to mention about, uh, first of all, the planning going from design to construction. As David said, we uh, they had installed some uh, what's called smart covers on the manholes out in the system. So one, we do extensive modeling to understand as we aim to bypass, we actually have to plug those systems, how that was going to work, were there potentially any impacts and how we were gonna mitigate that, what level was gonna be needed. And then also having those uh, smart covers uh, uh, deployed in the system. Uh, it allowed David's team to get real-time information at any time, what was going on with the levels and the conditions to make sure we were maintaining that. And then before we put basically, you know, two-thirds of this plan on bypass, uh, we demonstrated that system for uh, five days uh, straight without error before we uh, were confident to be able to put that into action. Uh, this photo here on the left is just the finished 96 inch diameter manhole. Uh, the scale probably doesn't come through on that, uh, but uh, you know, part of the benefit of precast uh, a structure, we can get very precise with inverts and flow channels and allow for a quick um, time to install. However, it leaves basically zero flexibility for changes in the field. And as Dave alluded to, uh, as we, as they were uncovering uh, these uh, numerous different laterals that came in, we found out that not every pipe was straight between each manhole to manhole. So we had to make some, um, you know, uh, quick uh, hands-on collaborative um, changes to make this all work out. And at the end of the day, it did. Uh, being able to restore the uh, life cycle, improve the performance and resilience. And uh, with that, we are uh, thankful for the city of uh, Surprise for giving us the opportunity. Greg, anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, Frederick, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, okay. Fred, if, uh, if I got two yeah. seconds just to add on to your sure. comment there, one of the things that made that possible was the particular vendor that we worked with here on these polymers was uh, is out of Las Vegas. Uh, so when we got down to the actual conditions and were able to uh, uh, shoot the inverts of the pipes that weren't quite where we thought they were going to be, uh, the fact that they were so close uh, gave us the ability to sort of make last minute changes before they went into production and um, get sort of a, a very customized product uh, literally four days after we gave them the information, um, you know, two days to make it and, uh, and a day to get it here. Uh, uh, so it worked out very well uh, for this project because of our proximity to, to Las Vegas where these particular products were made. Do you, do you guys remember yeah, the warranty? Great comment. I want to say it's 50 years, isn't it? Yeah, I, uh, Fred? I was looking, I couldn't. Uh, I, I believe that's the stated uh, life cycle for it. I'm, I'm not certain if that's the warranty, though. 
Great. Well, thank you guys. Um, yeah, we did have you. a couple of questions come in, so I, I'll read those out to you and whomever wants to take the question. Um, that'd be great. Um, I think you already touched on the warranty one. Um, there was a mention of odor control that was placed on the structure. What type of odor control was utilized? Oh, so we ended up not placing odor control uh, on the structure. So that was something that was evaluated. Uh, we did evaluate uh, both a um, carbon and a biological type odor control system. Um, however, based on uh, changing the configuration, which would keep more of the H2S in solution and maintaining that velocity, therefore just uh, keeping that flow, both the water and the H2S moving downstream, we determined it wouldn't be a, effective or have a, a, a realistic uh, return on the investment. So no odor control was added at this structure. Um, what was the most difficult obstacle you had to overcome with the project? That can go multiple ways, <laughs> depending on who you're talking Dave, to. Dave, I'd love to hear yours. <laughs> your um, thoughts. Uh, bypass pumping is a is just a scary proposition, um, and it it really to Fred's initial comment uh, about engineering and the municipal customers that we all work for making decisions uh, that are long-term ones. Uh, really sewer wet wells and coatings are really one of those that hit, hits home so clearly to the contracting community that ultimately has to be responsible for putting in the bypass pumping and having a 24-hour pump watch and everything that goes with, with bypassing a sewer lift station or in this case, you know, a structure um, that uh, the expense and the stress and everything associated with that um, was probably the biggest thing on this because again, it's two thirds of the flow coming into the city of surprise. And as we all know, you can't turn gravity off. So um, uh, my stress point was two thirds of the city of surprises uh, gravity flow. <laughs> that, would, that would have been the biggest challenge for us. The good news was is we were able to surcharge the system very far back. It, it extends very far in both directions. So there was plenty of ability to surcharge uh, and sort of balance out uh, the ebbs and flows of the system. As Fred pointed out, we ran the system uh, for five days to kind of make those tweaks, monitor it with the smart covers and get all that dialed in before we ever reached the point of breaking into the structure and, and reaching the point of no return. It's 25 years on the uh, MRR warranty. Awesome, thank you. Uh, anything, Frederick or Gregor, you want to add to that the last comment? Nope, I think last that was a good time? response. Thank you. Great. Um, why open cut the excavation for the JS versus shoring? You mentioned safety, or is there a cost difference, or something like that? Uh, I suppose that's my question is, yeah, yeah when we evaluated uh, what would need to be done in terms of the unknowns of the pipes coming in, uh, the angles that they came in, the depth that they came in, the fact that there was drop connections coming into the existing, uh, the fact that we had to demo the existing unit and, and the existing structure and the new one was going to go right in the exact position, all of that says we need room. As you saw from that initial one, um, that uh, the demolition equipment because of the size of the rebar and everything was pretty intense stuff. And to be frank, trying to do that in the confines of uh, box excavations or uh, like piles or anything just wasn't gonna work out to be uh, cost effective. Did I freeze up? Um, um, there, there was a comment, just FYI, MAG now has a sink. And then assuming the PDC SDR pipe was for pressure pipe, what was the plastic gravity pipe deflection limit at that type of depth? Mm. Um, if, I, if I recall, and again, this is just a recalling from it, our, um, if you're talking about deflection and angles of how it was seated, I know that's less than one and a half degrees. If you're talking about actual deflection of the pipe from weight, um, we chose the thickness based on loading calculations. So we would achieve, uh, ha achieve less than half an inch deflection. And as measured in survey in the as built, we, we uh, achieved no deflection on that pipe from the loading. 
And again, going to that whole thing of being able to just get down there, put the pipe in, shoot the actual center line, and then give that information to the supplier to have them finish up the connection and ship it out. Uh, we basically designed it and put it in. There was no, there, we had no wiggleness. We didn't really need any flexibility, horizontal or vertically, based upon our ability to dial in the connection uh, of the bases. Well, I think that's all the questions we have right now for your project. So again, congratulations to you. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to Joe real quick. Yeah, now we'll have our large project of the year presentation. Uh, Russ Walker from uh, Corolla will provide that presentation and Russ will let you take it away. Great, thank you. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yep. Well, great. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Arizona section of ASCE and the lifetime members for this great award and, and recognition. Uh, we're on behalf of the team. We're very appreciative and, and humbled to receive this honor. Um, th this was a real pleasure to work on this project, um, and I, I hope I can do this project justice in a, in a 10 or 15 minute quick overview because uh, it was a complex design and construction project, a lot of different elements, a lot of uh, key stakeholders and, and teammates. Um, so we'll kind of give a general overview, but happy to answer any questions. Um, really the overarching focus and the theme of this expansion project was really about maximizing value through optimization and collaboration. And let me expand on that a little bit more as we go through the presentation. But real quick, for those of you that don't know me, just a little background on me. I've been in the water industry for almost three decades. I've been here in Arizona for a little more than two decades. Uh, during my tenure here in Arizona, my focus has really been on integrated project delivery, both uh, construction management at risk and design build. And I've had the pleasure of delivering uh, several large wastewater treatment plant CMR projects here locally, uh, including this project that we'll talk about today. So I mentioned that the overarching goal and theme of this project of maximizing value through collaboration and optimization. And the success of the, of the delivery of this really came down to maintaining a clear focus around these three critical project objectives. Optimizing both the short and long-term operational performance of the facility, collaborating for cost-effective delivery, and as, as important for any wastewater treatment project or water reclamation project, uh, enriching the quality of life for the community and the stakeholders that the facility serves. So, you know, critical for any CMR project, it really is a commitment of true collaboration amongst all of the project stakeholders that's key. And we did have a number of stakeholders on this project. The, the Greenfield Water Reclamation Plant is located in the Southeast Valley uh, within the town of Gilbert, and it serves the wastewater treatment and water reclamation needs of three owners, the town of Gilbert, the city of Mesa, and the town of Queen Creek. And the city of Mesa serves as the lead agent and operates the facility, operates and maintains the facility. Uh, this plant also processes solids from Mesa's Southeast Water Rec plant, which are transferred to the facility via an 11 mile force main. So this does serve as a regional solids handling facility as well. The phase three expansion project was achieved through CMAR delivery. Uh, Corolla Engineers was the prime design consultant supported by our design partner, Brown and Caldwell. And McCarthy Building Companies was the construction manager at risk. Uh, but like so many projects, it really, particularly of this magnitude, it really takes a village. So I want to touch on some of the different players and, and, and key stakeholders within the project. On the engineering side, uh, Corolla was supported, as I mentioned, by Brown and Caldwell, who led the solids, odor control, and chemical feed facilities, as well as other discipline services. HDA Architects, um, was oversee the building architecture and canopies. EPS group completed site survey. Speedy and Associates for the geotechnical work. Uh, we had support from MacPro services for public outreach assistance and corrosion probe for their corrosion expertise. Similarly on the construction side, McCarthy utilized a handful of different key subcontractors for the completion of the project. AIMS relative to paintings and coatings, l, l Asphalt for paving, 
Matrix Services uh, led the, the digester construction, Progressive Roofing, Sun Valley Masonry, Prime Controls, K plus F and Electric, and Sturgeon Electric rounded out the major subcontractors on the construction side. So a few key facts relative to this phase three expansion project. Um, it was a capacity expansion of 14 MGD to increase the overall capacity of the plant to 30 MGD annual average day flow. Uh, it was about a three year uh, overall time period for conceptual preliminary and detailed design. So the, so the planning of this really started in Q2 of 2015 and carried through the first quarter of 2018. Construction um, by McCarthy started in November of 2017 and was roughly a three year total construction period. The, the guaranteed maximum price or total construction cost of this facility was $170 million with a total project cost just north of 200 million total. And you can see this is an aerial of the plant um, near the end of construction. A few other key uh, project metrics on the project. We had roughly 1,200 design drawings that were developed for the construction team. Uh, almost 34,000 total yards of, of concrete were, were placed. Uh, about 250,000 cubic yards of soil was excavated. Uh, roughly 26,000 linear feet of, of yard piping and 20, almost 29,000 linear feet of process piping was placed as part of this expansion. And over a million man hours, total man hours for the, for the construction was achieved. And you can see an excellent construction safety record, a uh, total of six recordables with, with zero lost time accidents throughout this three-year construction period. So a tremendous achievement by McCarthy and all of their subs for a very safe uh, construction site through that long duration. As I mentioned before, collaboration was also a critical success factor for the, any CMAR project, but particularly when you're maintaining or need to maintain operations of an existing facility during a complex construction project like this. Now, further challenging this project was the fact that in addition to the capacity expansion needs, there was also a number of asset renewal elements that were weaved within the scope including some significant replacement of electrical and controls elements. Uh, we replaced 60 of the existing variable frequency drives throughout the plant, 20 existing programming logical controllers, PLCs. Um, and we achieved this by through over a hundred um, MOPO plans, maintenance of plant operations. These are detailed uh, plans that we develop as a team to deal with the, the sequencing, the tie-ins, the shutdowns, everything that's required to make um, these sorts of additions and replacements while maintaining the operations of this facility 24-7. Uh, to assist with some of this asset renewal work on the electrical control side, McCarthy did bring in two design assist subs near the 60% design phase duration. Um, Prime was brought in for INC and K plus F for the electrical. Um, they helped with the planning, the sequencing, costing of, of those elements, and then continued forward with uh, as throughout the construction phase as well. And then as so many projects have been dealing with, uh, we weren't immune from the impacts of, of COVID during the later stages of construction, startup and commissioning. So it did have impacts on procuring some of the commodities and, 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 do, and some of the impacts of staffing as well as coordination with suppliers and representatives and vendors and equipment for the startup phase. Uh, but we, we hit that head on. McCarthy did a great job. The whole team did a great job with uh, planning for that and, and putting into place some contingency plans to be able to, to keep the project moving forward successfully without a huge impact of the overall schedule. So optimization was another critical success factor for this project. Uh, one of the challenging aspects of this project early on 
was to develop strategies on how to best deal with a significant increase in the strength of the influent wastewater that was coming into the facility that differed from the original design criteria from the previous expansion. You know, based on a, a combination of successful water conservation strategies, as well as tighter plumbing codes uh, related to new construction within this part of the valley, that influent strength of the wastewater and the corresponding loadings of that wastewater uh, as represented by higher concentrations of BOD, COD, total suspended solids and nitrogen. Um, it really required the overall team to strategize on how best to meet some of the technical challenges because of this increased loadings and do so within the specific budget constraints that the owners had. Um, optimization of annual O&M costs was also a, a, a clear focus, a critical focus of this project. And I'll talk about how we handled some of these different aspects as we go through the different processes. So this is a process flow schematic of the Greenfield plant showing both the liquids and the solids treatment train that's employed at the facility. Um, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but I will talk about some of the specific elements that were included as part of this plant expansion as we pictorially explore some of the various processes and equipment um, that was done as part of the phase three expansion. So let's start with the upfront part of the plant, the preliminary and the primary treatment elements. Uh, for this expansion, we constructed a second headworks facility at the site for influence screening and pumping, very similar to the existing headworks facility that was there. Uh, this facility included two new um, screens, influence screens with washer compactor units, um, as well as the addition of two new 16 MGD influent pumps uh, with variable frequency drives. Uh, the Headworks facility also followed by a new primary clarifier, number three, um, similar to the two existing ones, a 140 foot primary clarifier unit that had a corresponding primary sludge pump station. And then also included some, some odor control. So you can see several pictures here uh, up top of the screening facility, the primary clarifier dome cover uh, going in, um, sort of clockwise, the, the odor control on the bottom right and the influent pumps in a, in a dry pit arrangement on the bottom left. And here's some other photos, uh, post-construction photos of the preliminary and primary treatment, some of the screens and the influent pump station dry pit, the primary clarifiers, as, as well as uh, Headworks electrical control building, a new electrical building that was constructed to house a lot of the electrical gear, starters, uh, the VFDs associated with this new headworks and, and primary treatment facility. So moving from the preliminary and primary treatment to the secondary treatment train, uh, the secondary treatment is really the heart of, of any plant. And to reliably meet the nutrient removal requirements that this facility um, has <clears throat> to handle that increased wastewater loading that I mentioned previously, the team did have to pivot somewhat from the existing process train. Um, so for the phase three expansion, we did construct two new aeration basins, similar in size and layout to, the, to two existing aeration basins that were constructed under the previous expansion. Uh, but we did make some changes to the overall process to accommodate that increased wastewater strength. And one of those changes was converting from a conventional MLE process to a four-stage Bardenfo BNR process with some additional zoning and baffle walls and a little better control of the final stage uh, dissolved oxy oxygen content within the basin to get better overall removal from a, from a biological nutrient standpoint. Uh, these aeration basins also include uh, an integral zone within the basins, which we call CARB, Centrate and RAS Recycle. And this is specifically to treat the Centrate recycles from the solids handling uh, system, as well as increasing the nitrifier population within, the bio, within that BNR system to provide a robust baseline for treating the, the, the BOD, COD, TKN that's necessary. 
We also converted the coarse bubble aeration, uh, diffused aeration system with a, a new fine bubble diffused aeration. And all of these changes that were made within the new basins also were made within the existing basins. So we had to construct the two new air basins, get them started up, commissioned successfully, cut over that flow to the new basins while we took the existing basins down for an extended period and made these modifications. So there was a lot of careful sequencing and coordination with plant staff, the contractor, the design team to make sure that all of this was seamless. In addition to the aeration basins, we also constructed three new 120 foot secondary clarifiers as part of the secondary treatment system as well as a new RAS scum pump station integral to those clarifiers and made some changes expanding the secondary odor control system, a carbon activated carbon system that treats the foul air off the top of these aeration basins. So again, a few photos of the top of the aeration basins, photo of the fine bubble diffusers within the aeration basin and the secondary clarifiers. And a couple other post-construction photos of the the aeration basing uh, process and air piping, the, the secondary clarifiers with the covers installed, as well as a nice photo um, as one of those covers is being craned in um, on the secondary clarifier. Uh, the back end of the liquids treatment train is the tertiary treatment side. And this is where we made some of the most significant process deviations from the existing plant process train which were primarily driven by some ongoing O&M challenges that the plant staff had been experiencing over the years. Um, so from a tertiary standpoint, uh, the, the original plant did include tertiary filtration, although we made a conversion from an inside out filtration technology to outside in filtration um, using the aqua aerobics aqua disc uh, cloth media filters. We also made a conversion from their existing UV disinfection to chlorination dechlorination disinfection for this phase. And this included not only the construction of uh, two new chlorine con contact basins, but also uh, bulk hypochlorite and sodium bisulfite chemical storage and feed facilities to serve that chlorination dechlorination system. And finally, there were some additional non-potable water and reclaim water pumps that were added to the system, to the overall tertiary treatment system. So again, a collage of some of the photos of the filters, uh, including the, the backwash pumps with the filters and the CCB, the chlorine contact basin. And a few more photos of the non-potable water pumps, the reclaim water pump station, uh, the CCB, as well as the, the chemical storage and feed facilities that I mentioned before. So if the secondary treatment process is the heart of the plant, the, the solids handling train is the stomach or the digestive system of, of a plant and, you know, pun intended. Uh, the Greenfield Water Rec plant has a very comprehensive solids handling facility that includes sludge blending, thickening, and dewatering, as well as a number of support systems that are all housed within a, three, a large three-story building. For this phase three expansion, we supplemented those facilities with a new primary sludge screening facility to mitigate issues that plant staff had been having with fibrous materials within the downstream digesters, which was impacting their land application of biosolids. So we added two new primary sludge screens um, within a, an expansion of that three-story building. These screens are interchangeable um, whether to, to operate both for, from a three millimeter or five millimeter uh, screen size. We also included a new dewatering centrifuge within this facility and, and changed out the existing uh, high profile waste gas burners with two new low emission enclosed stack natural draft induction type waste gas burners, as you can see from the bottom right photo here. And then a few other photos of the solids processing facilities. Again, those waste gas burners next to the, the boiler building, um, the large solids handling building with the expansion of that for the primary sludge screens, which are shown, those two new sludge screens are shown on the bottom left. And then another photo of some of the centrifuges. 
And then rounding out from a biosolids treatment standpoint, you know, one of the most visible attributes of the green filled plant are the large egg shaped anaerobic digesters. Uh, so for phase three, we constructed an additional pair of new digesters. These are 1.2 million gallon tanks. Um, the digesters are conventional mesophilic, like I mentioned, in an egg shaped configuration. And these are constructed by welding thick steel plates that have a stainless steel dome and supported by a very robust concrete foundation. Uh, in addition to the new digesters, there was an expansion of the digester gallery that surrounds the digesters that house a number of the support systems, feed, mixing, recirculation pumps, as well as heat exchangers, uh, piping, and a lot of other ancillary equipment for the overall digester process. So a few more photos of the digesters, the, the, the boilers that are used um, to, to heat the, the sludge through the heat exchangers. Um, and you can see from a construction standpoint, the depth of these eggs, while you're seeing about um, you know, a half or a third of the eggs above ground, there's a significant infrastructure below grade to house that foundation as well as a good portion of the, of the steel digester itself. So a lot of effort to, to construct these facilities and a great job by the overall team. So I'll kind of wrap up here with a nice view of the plant construction. This is a, a shot looking from the east side of, of Greenfield Road to the west across the entire plant site. I think this was taken roughly midway through the construction phase. You can see the the new aeration basins being constructed uh, in the foreground here with the clarifiers and then the digesters behind that. And then the headworks and the primary facilities to the left and the tertiary facilities uh, on the bottom right. And, um, you know, again, a great effort, overall team effort by a lot of different stakeholders. I know a number of the, of the, uh, project team, my partners, the, the owners are participating in, in today's call. So really want to thank them for everything that they had did contributed to this project. As I said in the very beginning, it really takes a village to deliver a complex project like this. And this project was no exception. So with that, I think we've got some time, hopefully, for a few questions, if anybody has them. Great. Yeah, we actually did have a couple of questions, Russ. Um, why move from UV to chlorination or dechlorination for disinfection? It's a great question. Um, this was, as I mentioned, um, brought up by plant staff who were having um, some issues with the existing UV system from a cost standpoint. It was um, an intensive in terms of bulb replacement and, and just general maintenance. So we did a, a life cycle cost analysis during that conceptual design phase. Uh, looking at, you know, expanding that facility as well as evaluating other technologies and the chlorination dechlorination system was ultimately selected by the owners uh, to move forward with that for this expansion. Um, where does the reclaimed water go after the treatment? Another great question. Uh, each of the three owners have uh, different uses for their proportionate share of, of the reclaimed water. Town of Gilbert has a uh, sort of a reclaimed water or reuse distribution system. Um, so there is actually, they constructed a 5 million gallon reservoir adjacent to the plant. And so they're pulling off a portion of the reclaimed water flow and they're uh, distributing that within their system. Some of it goes to recharge, some of it goes to direct reuse or irrigation of, of golf courses throughout the town. Um, City of Mesa, um, they, developed an intergovernmental agreement with the Gila River Indian community and they exchange a portion of their reclaimed water or in exchange of, of the reclaimed water that they deliver to the Indian community, uh, they uh, get a, a, a portion of uh, credit for CAP water from a water supply standpoint. And then the town of Queen Creek um, is also engaged with Gilbert and, and Mesa relative to delivery of their portion. So some of theirs is going to reuse and they're looking to expand their, their reuse and recharge uh, capability moving forward. So it has a number of uses for all three of the communities. Great. 
Um, who was the structural engineer? So the structural engineering was done by Corolla and, and Brown and Caldwell uh, in-house. Um, again, Corolla focused more on the liquids train, Brown and Caldwell on the solids train. So uh, the portions of, of the work split, we each did our own structural engineering. Um, why burn off gas versus biogas applications? So we evaluated uh, cogeneration exhaustively. This was evaluated during the phase two expansion uh, and again evaluated during the phase three expansion. And it really just came, came down to, to, to the cost benefit ratio of the capital expenditure um, of putting in a cogen system. And we are, they are using a portion of that gas to, to heat the boilers for, for heating the sludge. So it's the it's excess gas that isn't used within the boilers that does get um, directed to the waste gas flares. But we did evaluate cogeneration and it just did not pan out from a, from a cost benefit ratio to include those components at this time based on the volume of gas that's produced. Um, last question I have is what was the most difficult design obstacle you had? Um, I think one of the most difficult obstacles was the fact that this was an operating facility and we had to take that into account from the very beginning, particularly some of the EI and C components that I mentioned, the, re the replacement of the VFDs and the PLCs. I mean, this was the construction of this facility was was really like doing open heart surgery and brain surgery concurrently. And it required a lot of planning, a lot of close coordination, a lot of paint, patience by plant staff. Um, and that was probably the most difficult aspect of making sure that we had the necessary sequencing and planning in place to not disrupt plant operations throughout this three years of construction. And, and a great job by all of the parties and stakeholders that were involved in that effort. All right, well, that is all the questions I have. Again, congratulations to all of our award winners. Um, thank you so much for, for giving your time to present to us today. And thank you to all of our membership that uh, tuned in and hope to see you guys at our next webinar next month. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye, thank you.